Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. I am Carl Chesser, and this is uh, Tend to Your Observability Garden. Um, this talk, I try to keep some kind of notes high level in the synopsis, if you're curious, is that there's a lot of things that take to kind of maintain your environments, but also just like how you're trying to change things in a large org organization. And so a lot of this comes back to when, to me, when I hear observability, it's a property in your software, but it's also, it deals with several social technical challenges, so both cultural and in your systems. So this talk's gonna kind of touch on several of those factors, uh, how we try to maintain this stuff, especially like cultural aspects, because it's like ongoing, it's never like solved. <laughs> and then also how we try to grow and scale stuff. So when you have like technical things, you're trying to introduce new changes or offer new things, as New Relic keeps introducing new features, you're trying to, how do you inform people about it? How do you scale it? How do you manage configuration consistently? So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Cerner Corporation. Um, many people aren't familiar with Cerner. It's not a typical like consumer brand you'll hear about. So we deal uh, healthcare technology. So you think about hospitals, EMR systems. Uh, we have a lot that deal both with kind of that transactional data from the EMR system to both large big data sets uh, for population health as well as device integration. So that, you know, think of smart pumps or lots of data that's pumping between there. So it's a very complex and large growing environment. Uh, and so that there's a lot of challenges that come in that space. And so you think about systems that grow as well as trying to, they're very critical. And how can you both measure and observe those systems closely? Uh, another part about that is if you don't know, uh, uh, we're from Kansas City, so that's what, where the headquarters are for Cerner. And so I always joke with people when you hear about Kansas City, they're always like, oh, is that Kansas or Missouri? Uh, we're in the Missouri side. That's where I, I also live, so right smack uh, in the middle of the United States. And um, a lot of times I'll have parts in here that are some are just my drawings I share. So hopefully they're visible. And, and I try to do this in more of a storytelling format. So I'm going to explain challenges they went through. And so usually these are all lessons learned and things we had to work through. And I'm in this mode, too, that all this stuff is not easy. So when you hear this, uh, I feel like sometimes we describe things that and we solve it, but usually it's like a first iteration. When you deal with something at scale, getting consistency across environments, that is like ongoing uh, challenge, especially as new things come out. So in the format of this talk, I'll give a little bit of the background on some of the challenges and how we started getting involved with New Relic and how we were growing our kind of observability environment. Uh, as well as kind of going through these lessons learned. And so this will kind of hit on some things of like what challenges you run into and hopefully maybe this will relate and we have some good discussions. So we can, um, we have kind of questions at the end, but I, hopefully this uh, signals several things you may have encountered as well. And then have a little bit of summary at the end as well. So the first part about it, when we had our environment, Cerner is a fairly old uh, company in my mind from a technology company. So you think about like 40 years you have uh, 2017 is really when we started engaging more with New Relic at that time. We were trying to, we had a lot of things we were growing in terms of new technical footprints, and we wanted to have a very um, uh, lower cost to how we had observed those systems. So you think about when you're at a, a large company, you may be running your own type of telemetry data collection or a system to, you know, for visuals uh, for. Uh, a graphite instance back then. And that was a cost. Like every time you would grow systems, you would encounter challenges of that system as it grew. It would push and put pressures on those other types of systems. And so at this time, we were trying to really figure out how could we grow this and use it. And so we were, of course, you're starting with a smaller subset of examples. In this case, we had a small set of uses and also some sub accounts, some subdivision that we had on usage. Um, however, what I thought was really helpful is as you grow anything, it's really easy to where you can start champing around it because you have this kind of nice, clean example people can understand and you can adapt it pretty quick. If you don't like it, you can work with one team, talk through what changes you need to do, and it's, it's, it's an easier model. But it's also helpful for that storytelling as you're trying to grow it in a big company to say, hey, here's, here's how it works, works really well, and then as new things come out, you can adapt it, but you can work really closely with that other team uh, to do it. And so this is what's, to me, a, a great way of going fast because you only have a, like a subset of people and they're usually their best champions on it because they're the ones that are, in terms of an adoption curve, they're that early adopter type part of the curve. Back, now this is, you see a little stipulation here. This is where I can't remember exactly what, but this is kind of like middle in, in my mind of a time frame that we were adopting. By 2019, we had a lot more things getting instrumented as well as kind of all these related entities are being instrumented. So as they keep sharing updates with New Relic and how everything gets normalized around these different entities that you can see, 
we have lots of entities in our environments. Um, I usually use the example, this is a similar time when we started introducing Kubernetes into our environments of running workloads. At this time, it was still fairly early for us, but that increased a lot of different things that we, what we were trying to also observe. And so it was a large growth footprint of just data that we're trying to collect and understand it. We also were getting a lot more users. So Cerner is, is 25,000 um, associates. Uh, we have, in our, at that time of our account, I think it was like over 3,000 users that it grew up to. And so as we're going through it, we had like a lot of active users, but you're trying to, you know, activate a, a kind of a, a very high usage. So you're looking for the users that use it a lot. So you might have a broad base of some using it and some really using it a lot more. How do you just keep that engagement? Because you have to manage all these users across there. And we had about like over 100 sub accounts. So we had a lot of sub account creation on, on how we would have different areas that would grow and use it. It would have a different sub account. So if you're familiar with some of the account structures in New Relic. I'll talk a little bit more how we've grown this um, if you're curious as well. And one of the things that we found was as that kind of that one point, and even when Bill was showing a lot of their growth on data, we had so many more things now that just kept growing on that influence. So as we had things that were being instrumented this way, we were growing our deployments, we also were getting like new features from New Relic, which was also growing, how much stuff was like coming through. So a lot more things being instrumented, data that was coming in our environment. So you had, you had to look at how you're managing the ingest costs, things that are coming from New Relic, as well as you got more things that are keep coming. And you are wanting to encourage this like central way of doing it and getting more people to use it. But it's, it becomes challenging because you have these kind of like two dimensions that are both growing and you're trying to kind of uh, deal with that larger space. So as it was coming, you started getting this kind of growth, and I said this was like gross, growth with diversity. Different use cases were now coming in. When you had that earlier example, that little, I guess, flower that I was trying to show, people could see that they really wanted, but they also had their different use cases of what they wanted to use. And so you're like, this is great. Let's like, come on board. But however, we're trying to, as we were growing, to grow with consistency. So you're trying to have like standard ways of how you'd use um, you know, the Java um, agent that you're going to have to use instrumentation on. So how do we centrally document that? How can we put it as, as close as we can to the platform to take away those concerns from other teams doing that instrumentation? And so with this, this came a kind of a bigger challenge with growth with inconsistency. So as things would grow, you'd find other things that would be working well, but it wouldn't match how we had these kind of uh, shared like definitions, like this is how you should be having your agent configured, or this is how we had naming conventions that we had established on apps so that an app name had semantic meaning. You could read the name, you can actually know, oh, I have an idea what it means, or a sub account. This sub account has this naming structure, so I know it's a production account. Um, and so it kind of helped give a little bit where you say we need to have consistency across really critical areas, but you start seeing other areas that gr were growing in good ways too, but it wasn't still consistent. So then it came back to, well, how can we enable that growth? Because we got different people using it in different ways, which was exciting, but it was also a different part of challenge. So this is something I feel like is a common challenge at a big organization. And I often will reference, like uh, I think Spotify shared this at one point with when they kind of talk about autonomy and alignment, where you're really wanting to uh, give teams autonomy to use things. So when you have New Relic as like a, kind of a, a SaaS provider providing newer features, you want to get access to those features pretty quick and how people can use them. But also you want to really value alignment, like a consistent way it's being applied and approached. So that way you can upgrade and provide features to all your different teams without finding like, oh, we like install and manage the agent in way too many different uh, ways. And therefore it's going to be really hard to keep rolling out enhancements with it. So I feel like you're always in this mode of these two sides of this spectrum. How can you help get this consistency that you're striving for um, with this like alignment, but also you really want to favor autonomy. You want to give teams the ability to use those things. You're not like, oh, you need to only go through this team to give you that feature and you put a bottleneck in your company and therefore really limits all the benefits you're talking about, what you want to get from a, a platform like New Relic. So that was a little bit about the background. So at this point we were growing and you can see as you're growing, you're gonna have this kind of struggle between this aut autonomy and alignment. And you're also trying to deal with how can you introduce change, meaning how can you manage your growth? How can you keep people on the same page and keeping knowledge at that level? And so this is a, several of the lessons learned that we had at Cerner, or at least how I articulate them. Um, and so hopefully they, they, these can resonate on some of these challenges. And I kind of put it in two different categories. 
One is a little bit on community building, which you could view this as when I talked about the social technical challenges of the definition with observability, like how do you introduce something? Well, there's a big cultural component of that. But I'll hit a little bit on this kind of community building piece of it, which is really important at a large enterprise. The other part around is just some concrete examples that maybe can help resonate how you want to become more consistent in offering things so that that challenge of the spectrum of autonomy and alignment, you make the things that you want to achieve easy because you're trying to bake it into common points that have automation that lend itself to help you overall. And so we'll talk a little bit here at the beginning on this community building around kind of meetups and documentation. So sometimes I feel like this gets brushed over pretty quick of how you build a knowledge base at a company. Some of this is kind of unique, but I'll give you some concrete examples how New Relic helped us as well um, as we do this. So one was around meetups. And what we started doing, and this was, I think, about three years ago, maybe four, we started having an internal meetup on it. We just called the observability meetup. That was really important because at a large company, you have different tool sets, tool chains, different subsystems people use, where you have different ideas coming up, and you're trying to bring things together. And so you're trying to have people share what they use, how they're using it, and then you find out connection points like, oh, this is why you want to switch over to this newer way of doing it. And so you want to make it like a common routine way of offering that kind of knowledge sharing. What we found was really helpful was you want to have with a lot of things with knowledge sharing, you want to make it where it's a kind of a consistent routine schedule of doing it, of how you go share and give content. But having a meetup at your company, that's yet another thing you're trying to manage. So it's hard when you have a lot of things on your plate. And so cadence was kind of an important piece of what we we're going through in here. And so what we found over several years of doing it, we found the cadence for us was like doing it every other month. And one of the important pieces of that is that we had New Relic was a staple in that. So they would come every other month and share what's new. And so one of the things that I like to share on this point was having where there's good New Relic content that's always, because there's new things coming out all the time, and you have a point to digest and start informing people about it, explain this is out, but we can't use it just yet because we're gonna make these other changes. So that way it's not like you're answering this in all these little discrete pockets in like a discussion form. You're trying to have it a, a sync point back across all your teams. So if you haven't checked it out, I try to put the little link down here, but there's a what's new, and I love this type of format. So I often find a way it's really quick to grok content off of screen is like just like any other change log of content, like what's what has been added, what may be getting removed a little bit. And it's a brief enough summary. So this has been maintained, I want to say, it's at least been over a year. I remember going here often and I just would look back at the last two months and say, what's important to us out of what's new? Because there's lots of things that keep coming out. And then talking with uh, New Relic and say, hey, can you come share a little bit more context? Give us a live example, a little bit more that may be some good depth to that'd be contextualized in our company because there's a lot of things, again, people are curious about what they can and can't use. So if you haven't used this What's New resource, definitely use it. I, I use it often uh, just, just to kind of stay up to date on things. Another thing was a challenge was all the growing features. So when you talk about newer things coming out, like what's in that What's New, there's a lot of new and cool stuff at New Relic. And when you're at a big company and people are using in that case of like, you want to give autonomy, you find out newer features coming out and who can use these things and people are going to ask and it sometimes it's overwhelming because some people want to turn something on and you're trying to go back to giving a consistent way of building it or enabling it to, to go forward so this also helped a little bit on that how when a newer feature came out so with pixie that was a big interest to us because we use kubernetes but pixie also had some things we also had to work through in our controlled environments to actually introduce it so people are like oh can i install pixie tomorrow like hold on like our account isn't ready for that yet we're working through the, those pieces of it and so you can kind of give again a general update but then contextualize within your company so there's a lot of cool things that kind of come up with this but keeping that routine and then also showing practical examples of how it can be used so it isn't just reading the content having someone like new relic come share like here's, here's what it looks like and there's a taste of it helps keep people's interest and they can see good use cases in their environment. The other thing on here too is like depending on what you have within your company, you don't, this, when we talked about managing a meetup, you only have like so much time to help like share content. So I kind of want to make sure this is like called out. As you're going about it, make sure you're doing a, a good way of how you consolidate topics, content being shared, and recordings. So like, like any other meetup, if you do it internally, it helps because an internal meetup, you one, reduce the barrier of sharing ideas because sometimes you have to like put a filter on like what things can I share publicly that we're working through. So having an internal meetup helps just people sharing ideas, 
but then you want to be capturing stuff. So in my example, we're, we use Office 365 a lot. So we record all these, we try to inventory those. That way we can always recall them because not a lot of times New Relic will share, hey, this is new things coming out or it's beta. We'll get a good example. So then when it's GA, we refer back to that content and say, hey, everyone remember because we have different team members that may join. They weren't here for that meetup. So you wanna make this easy. You don't wanna make like replaying or sharing content a challenge for you as you're growing all your approaches at your company. Um, the other thing we've been trying to do is just trying to keep a, a like a, a common discussion form for it. So if you have something internal, try to do that where you're always answering questions in that same space. Um, this is really important because we've went through a couple transitions on how we're managing content like uh, for discussion forums. And you gotta be active in those spaces if you want to actually get people to post questions in those. If you don't, aren't spending time in that space, you find where the discussions still happen, but they're in like a private channel, right? They're an email to you or in a chat. And you're really trying to externalize those con questions and topics because other people have them, they just may not have brought them up yet. So just remember uh, at least a lesson learned from us on doing these meetups is like, you gotta make sure you're externalizing it, keeping active, you gotta spend some time on it. And you also wanna get leverage of past content. Figure out a way how you're in inventory, past recordings or anything like that. That way people who come new to your company can catch up and you have a, something you can always recall. The other one on here is like documentation. Sometimes I find like people often find this to be a boring topic. Like, yeah, of course you have to document these things. But we found that like this was a challenging where we had different like tooling or uh, standards of what we had on specific tooling at Cerner. There would be a, a, a team that'd be around that'd be help managing it. And we really wanted to make sure this was more collaborative. So as new things come up or there was a gap, we wanted someone to actually make a pull request, like contribute documentation to it versus saying, oh no, this other team will add that into the documentation. And so we started making this handbook several years back, which it had just common standard stuff that we want to make sure uh, how you, if you're going to use this with the agent, here's like, again, the, the naming standards that we had on account names or uh, application naming. And so it was important, therefore, to say, here's the documentation. If you want to add someone to this, here's how you can do a pull request to add that con content into it. So it's just, you know, documentation in GitHub. We use uh, GitHub Enterprise. So it was an easy way of like getting people to contribute content back. This is, a, this is also important, so as you're getting through this, you realize there's a lots of topics that people want to like discuss, and you say, I can't, I don't wanna actually just ha answer this in a one little forum. You can make issues and track it with your documentation too, which I found was also helpful. So going to that Pixie example that we shared earlier, when it first came out, we just like created a GitHub issue and say, hey, here's some, we need to add more notes about Pixie usage in our environment, but then we'll start documenting that here in the near term. We just don't have a full answer yet, but that way you can refer people back to that discussion thread versus a, another discussion forum. So the, the big part about this is that like I mentioned that issue that you log, try to engage in this. This takes some time, but you're trying to make it, when I talked about earlier, like getting people to collaborate on it, you're trying to make it easier for everyone to participate in your company, not just like a, a one team that's like your internal new relic team. While that can work, what we found was trying to get to where other people will feel willing to contribute into it helped a lot more as well if there was a gap. Like, how do we do this here? Well, here's some of the notes. Can you help contribute and add into that? Uh, made it much easier. And then two, if it does, isn't answered in that like central location, create an issue as that place marker and say, here's where the discussion's at. Once we have enough notes, we'll add into your docs as well. But this is like an ongoing thing. Every time I feel like we don't have something answered, like, oh yeah, let's try to centralize that again, but don't make it the burden of only one team because then it comes back to that kind of limiting factor of who could share what. All right, so that was a little bit more on that community building, some of the pieces on there. I'm gonna get a little bit more on some of the automation and stuff we try to do across all of our accounts. So we have a lot of infrastructure and things that we monitor today. Uh, but one of the things we also touch on is our account structure. So we, when we've grown, we have lots of sub accounts. We also have how we have our parent accounts that how we have access across those and what we have access on the partnership API. So I kind of put this up here because we use this, at least I've had to use this often recently in trying to manage consistency across all of our environments. Um, but I'm curious from the crowd, does anyone, does anyone use the partnership API today? I don't see any hands. This is a little bit of a limiting factor. So do talk with your new uh, rep if you haven't, because it's certain, certain accounts only have access to that are considered a partner. Um, so you may check this out because there's good documentation out there for it, but it gives you some of these accesses across your accounts. I think there's also changes that are upcoming um, as well with it. So do reach out. So I put a little stipulation and if you read on their docs, they'll kind of say, hey, you know, 
talk with you and you like you really like rap about it if you are curious. So one is around this. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on this for a little bit of the account structure. Um, this helped a lot. And if you think about it, if you have, let's say, 10 sub accounts um, or even uh, 20, like you, you generally have a challenge of asking or answering a question on your own without going into every one of these accounts and trying to query across them. And so you have this case of a parent and sub account. So those parent accounts make it easy to ask questions around it. But the partnership API can help you do across all of your accounts, which is really helpful. So it allows you to iterate through a sub accounts and gives you a kind of a programmatic ask, access through it through a REST API. Um, and I'll give you some examples of how I used it recently, um, which also may help uh, like what kind of questions or what are the general challenges you have to work through on it. Because it isn't easy, again, when you have many sub accounts. Um, so this is an important piece that we've had to work through. So here's something that's out of New Relics Docs. If you're curious, when you talk about the partnership, and there's also this higher parent partnership owner account. So a lot of times this gets referred to as a POA account, uh, which is if you're in this kind of account structure, oftentimes I think most people are familiar with this parent and child account. Um, but if you have a lots of accounts, you may have a structure where you can have a partnership set up, which allows you this kind of like larger uh, kind of span. And so what's important here is there's two things that help you on. One is this kind of orange box. That's that partnership where you have the partnership API that allows you to actually like ask, hey, can you give me, give me all the accounts? It gives you metadata about each one of those accounts. So what account IDs and stuff that exist. And then it lets you also start inquiring. So you think about all the other APIs that you have in your Relic, usually assume therefore you have the sub account or account ID. And so this is like an, an entry point to start doing that discovery. The other one up here on the partnership uh, or the POA account, this is where a lot of times you'll do a lot of uh, Nurkle queries at that level that can span across all your accounts. So if you're trying to look at active users or ingest across all these accounts, that's really important. So as you're growing things, we talked about the two dimensions where you have more things you're instrumenting in your own kind of products as well as the growth of instrumentation that you know, New Relic is offering you have ingest is always increasing. So it's kind of important to be looking at that because this gives you that global view across all of them. So again, this was really, really helpful for us to start like digging into it. So let's do, a, here's one of the examples. So this is an example of what the partner API looks like. So if you go to their partners uh, documentation, you'll see kind of a structure where uh, you'll get a partner, think about like an account I, I identifier, so you have a, access through a partnership API. But from there, you'll get a list of all your accounts. So it just kind of is like an account object that gives back. So thing by you could call REST API, gives you an array back of all these accounts. From there, then you have the accounts. So then you can look at like different parts, the metadata, what accounts you have. You may have canceled accounts or active accounts. But then you can start asking questions across your system. And of course, you can invoke other things. So what I've really loved about New Relic is that um, as often as it feels like a very much a API first. So there's so many things that get offered from New Relic, but there's always an API oftentimes it's in close parallel with it. And so when that happens, if you can't find it, you're like, oh, I guarantee there's something in the API. So there's, they, there's generally good documentation um, and support around it. And so in this case, uh, you could use like GraphQL to be doing some functions, oftentimes it's helpful to ask you know, questions across your accounts. This example I had over here was around uh, what we were doing with APM logging. So you probably heard the announcement. Did anyone catch that when it got first announced when APM logging was coming out, it was automatically turned on? I see some heads nodding. So like at a big account, uh, you had to be concerned. Like, wait a minute, we want to gradually turn on something. What features do we want to have that both from, again, consistency at an agent level as well as how we're going across it. So this allowed, I could iterate through all these, and then I could, of course, think about this as just like a, uh, a Ruby type utility. So it can use uh, just like a block where it builds out APIs and it's just interpolating and putting in the account ID. So you can invoke the GraphQL across all your accounts if you wanted to do a mutation and like say, let's disable it across all accounts at a certain date. So it just makes it really easy because then you start thinking about something at scale. This allows you that kind of administrative thought of how can you manage stuff first um, if you want to roll something out in a gradual way. Another one was around communication. So has anyone went through changes to like the new user model where you have both like full and basic users and considering that for costs? Let's see, heads nodding. 
So a lot of times people are like, what does that mean? I, I want to... I don't want to like lose functionality when we have like hundreds to thousands of people using it. You want to use some data to inform you of that. And what helped us is working with our new Relic team. They shared back and pulling data of looking at all of our users and saying, well, here's users that use these features. Essentially, you think about through the UI, that would be full type feature functionality. And so when we had all that, it helped looking at it and say, okay, how do we want to first, we need to inform people. So this goes back to how do you introduce change in a big company. You don't want to say, hey, everyone, we're just going to switch. You know, This population will be full or this population will be basic users. You want to actually help inform sub-accounts, so the um, kind of the uh, admins within those, as well as the population to say, hey, heads up, here are people that are going to be full, here are going to be in this basic based on activity in the last you know, three months. And so what's helpful here is that we were able to use the partner API, the partnership API to go ahead and inquire across accounts, look at users, and also have data that was supplied by New Relic to iterate over all those and say, here's a population which is essentially like your super users, ones who actively use it, and here are ones that are like more of a, an occasional user. Either they haven't logged in a lot or they just do some basic, you know, they have their own little dashboard and it, it works really good for a basic user. And so this helped a lot because then in that flow, you could start communicating out, meaning you could generate unique messages and email out to all these sub-account owners to say, here's what it means. So you don't like just broadcast, but then they have to figure out what it means within their sub-account. You want to give contextual, meaningful data around their account and usage. So kind of an example of this, um, this goes back to that earlier example, same kind of root point, we're using that partnership API. For us, it was trying to figure out all your sub-accounts, but if you don't have this and you just have a handful of sub-accounts, you can just think, I have an array of sub-accounts. But as you're doing that, each one of those can give you back information about your users. And that, of course, has like their email address or parts of their identity that you can use for communication. So you can say, is it a, do I just have the user ID or, in this case, an email address? And so the email address is how you, in this case, we have a flow where we go through all the accounts. We are mapping it to the activity that our New Relic team told us about. Like, here's structure who actively uses it. Here's the ones who haven't used it in a while. Here are the ones who use full. So it gave you that metadata, and then we just matched it up. So we had, essentially, it was a CSV file that from the New Relic team. And then we went ahead and iterate through that uh, information. So we could say, hey, every sub-account um, uh, uh, owner or admin in, the, in their space, here's who's going to be moved over to full, here's going to be um, uh, moved as basic, provide early announcements on that, and then it kind of helped a lot as a communication flow for that chain. Uh, versus, again, saying, hey, we got hundreds of people that will get being switched over, uh, they didn't really know what it meant in their accounts. So this helped a lot of, again, doing that thing at scale. If you think about it, too, there's probably a lot of other things you may want to use the same thing for, for informing people about what they use and when you're going to change it, too. So when you're a big company, you want to introduce something new, you have a lot of other ways of using just the metadata out of your relic from your user base to then inform them, here's how we're going to introduce or enable this next thing out. Um, so they're, again, not, not knowing you're using data from their account. You're getting usage uh, data to inform you of how to, how to do that type of communication. And so this other part too, which is a, and I'll go through a couple examples of this, but it was trying how you manage resources as code. So this is really helpful for us if you think about when I gave that earlier example of from our 2017 to where we are today, um, of trying to, if you want to build something, you know, you don't want to like keep doing something only in the UI and then you have like you've separated accounts from both a production and non-production view and then you're manually recreating it in another. You want to just treat it as code. So you have one area, you may be doing a playground on it to try to build it out, but you want to have some automation that builds that in your accounts on your behalf. And so this kind of became really important as we went through it, because we had different approaches at Cerner. When we first were starting this, we kind of had our own uh, utility. And I'll show you that here in a second and what we kind of evolved to. But this is another important piece of scale. So we talked about the autonomy to consistency. This helps a lot on the consistency level, especially within a team. So you say, here's approaches, how we apply it. Here's a way we use it as kind of a as code approach of managing new relic resources. So then you can get other people that actually contribute and do that same approach as well. So with this, we had uh, this earlier example. So we think about it like um, you could have like other type of command level type utilities. So we had our own uh, new relic gem that we would use that would manage resources. And this was really early on. Uh, but it was helpful because we said, hey, here's a way of how 
Uh, you can declare things out in, in code. So you can think about as a YAML file, as many things are today. And you can have this utility and it'll work with the New Relic API and sync this up. So you keep this stuff source controlled in a repository and you can use this utility to manage it, um, which worked well. Like it, there's a lot of things that are applying it, but that, that picture I had before where we had a subset of teams that were early, they're the ones who are kind of the adopters and maintaining that. As you can imagine, this isn't really unique to uh, the general community of New Relic, um, nor do we want to really manage a, a unique utility long term. We'd rather use what other communities are using. So once more things started coming out with New Relic Terraform provider, that was what we started transitioning away from. So instead of manning our dashboards with this gem, the Terraform provider was a great way to say, let's start referencing this and moving forward as a way of managing as code. And so that helped us start saying, what are great ways of trying to configure and managing it? Uh, we had things of the past. So like, again, that uh, previous gem utility that we had that again was internal to something that was much more easier to manage with something like Terraform. But as you can imagine, this is really helpful because you're trying to do this consistency across environments. So doing something with a Terraform provider is a great way of managing it. The other one that we had on here too was, uh, we've, again, this was across different teams, but was uh, when you're trying to do automation across them, we've had different groups kind of have a different, slightly different approaches that will have commonality. One example is where we had things where teams would define something in a central repository where it was a definition of their application. And so a lot of this was for our services. We used to call these things just a service profile, but think about just like a, again, another YAML definition of the thing that they're trying to run. This kind of helped us do a lot of things because from this definition, we could generate a lot of other kind of components of how we'd integrate New Relic or instrument things off of that application. The thing that was helpful with this is that we actually started creating, think about you wanna have like standard views or alerts on an application that you just want baked in. Uh, you can do it if you have this shared definition, let's say this YAML file describes like what, what application, some like key things about the team and other information. You can generate Terraform's information that you're then using the Terraform provider for that integration. So this therefore allows teams to not, they don't manage the Terraform as part of the platform component but that central kind of definition is what is the, the key inter interaction you have with a platform team and then teams building on top of that. But this helped then because then we're also not doing kind of a, a bespoke or unique way of managing interactions with New Relic. We're just using the Terraform provider at that point for managing it. And then the other part about this too is how when we were feeding this, was when we were generating it, that Terraform provider was that interaction point. So you think about a build system, it's just using Terraform to therefore um, like sync all this, these builds up. So if you were having applications being built, it was then just using Terraform under the covers to then uh, provide this integration. And so we kind of call this a lot of times you had like managed views, but think about like alerts or dashboards, it's just content that you're trying to say, look, there's standard things we want provided, but this is what we want to like have folded in automatically, not do not do this uniquely across any one of your single accounts. There was a blog post that we had shared some of this content. Um, so there's several things that we had on here as well. But I think another important piece of this is around like just maintaining agents. So like uh, you think about that same example and I'll, I'll kind of walk through that too, but keeping agents uh, consistent is really important. And that's when you found a lot of challenges, especially uh, like the you know, last December with log for shell like that was just keeping all your agents and be able to upgrade that consistently across your entire fleet of applications was really important. So this one was saying like, look, if you have a similar type of uh, setup to where you can upgrade one specification and then generate that and saying, look, just automatically upgrade the agent, all those apps that had the same shared YAML specification that we have internally, we're generating all the deployment kind of manifest information from that. So that really helped trying to say, New Relic is just automatically being included in that environment versus you know, different teams trying to manage it on their behalf. Um, so you, again, when you get up to scale, then you start figuring out, oh wow, you'll start looking across, because you can query a lot of your data to figure out where your agents are at. Um, I don't know if anyone used the agent groundskeeper. I see some nods. That was a big one getting used across with to find out variants or what teams have it. But that helped a lot of one, looking at that state. Two, that earlier example, the uh, if you have a parent account or that a POA account to query across all of your accounts, that really helps too, just so you can start getting insight, well, who's at what version, who needs to upgrade um, to kind of move that forward. 
All right, so now we're here at the summary. So we touched a little bit on a, a few things, and I'll try to recap it in a couple other points that I made. One was around trying to do this stuff of the cultural aspects, when you're trying to inform or keep people up to date on it, was this like routine time to catch up on things. So the, remember the what's new that New Relic shares? That's really important because every time these new things come out, or even sometimes it seems like small changes, but then you want to keep people on the same page of what does that mean or what changes come through it. You want to get ahead of it. So having a routine time really helps you do it in your team or company um, versus like trying to do it in a more ad hoc type manner. Another one's on that whole central documentation approach where we said, look, there's going to be things that keep coming up or how we want to standardize or what things you should have included in your agent or what things you should not. Uh, this was helpful to say we need to keep maintaining this. We just call it our new Relic Handbook. The thing about it just is like a central repository. It isn't where only one team maintains it, but people can contribute to it just like they would have with like pull requests in their code. It's just a pull request with markdown files. It really helps centralizing it, that content to get access to it. Another one too is on this kind of stable contracts. And so I kind of mentioned that little example of those like YAML specifications around an application and then a platform team is using that to actually generate and provide things on their behalf. So it automatically creates, you think about like a container image that includes the New Relic agent in a specific version or a specific New Relic agent configuration. Same thing is true of all the other managed things, a managed alert or a managed view on that. That helps a lot, so that way teams aren't dealing with that at all. It's just something that's provided on their behalf. So when they're in New Relic, they're able to access a lot, but they're getting some things that are just you know, automatically included. This really helps a lot, because that way you're not, that example I moved from the New Relic gem that we were managing to do automation several years back, no teams weren't having to do that when they were just following this, because they weren't managing the New Relic configuration. It just was getting generated on their behalf. The other part on here too is that uh, the community pattern, so we talk about refactoring things, you'll find there's, I feel like there's oftentimes like a gap as you're building things out, and you're like, hey, someone else probably hasn't solved this. Keep looking, you know, of course, the open source type approaches, but that, my example, was the new Relic gem that we had and went to Terraform. You get a lot better support, you're not managing some other automation um, in the mix, so this has always helped us a lot, is just keeping looking externally and trying to contribute in those environments. The partnership API, again, this is kind of more of a limited use case, but this was an example of how to use automation across when you have hundreds of accounts, like trying to deal with that. That was a great point of having kind of an API access, allows you to walk through that graph of all these accounts, allows you then to use, so my example of inquiring about APM logging, I can iterate across all those accounts and therefore invoke and interact things with it, like with the GraphQL API. That's super unhelpful, like, because otherwise you'd be like, I need a whole team to start, you know, checking this, or you don't want to ask all, you know, admins, can you go check your account? Like, you need to do it, and you want to be able to have easy ways of auditing or changing your accounts. So this was a really helpful way of approaching that. And the other part on there is that, that whole thing around seeking easy ways to do the stuff that's just ongoing. So you think about like the, the, the task of, of grass growing in your yard, it's always happening. So you have to figure out ways that it's not gonna go away. Keeping your agents up to, up to date or trying to build that in aut for automatically for your deployments. Make that an easy thing to do so that you can one, always discover when there's a new agent that's released. How do you have a cadence that always gets pre-built and built that into your platform so teams aren't managing it, they just manage this kind of API contract to just declare what they are building. And then therefore you can kind of keep upgrading and moving things ahead. You'll find things that lag in this space, and that's when you find out, oh, they don't have the same automation. That helps you identify, oh, you should, should we get this included in the same area, or should you follow the same approach because you're slightly different in a, same, in a technical platform? Um, this has helped a lot because, again, over years going through it, you, you want to really minimize that kind of ongoing cost of keeping your stuff up to date. All right, and that was it. So that was the that was the talk on one. We talked a little bit on the the social type, the the community type efforts, as well as some of the technical examples of trying to manage things across accounts and even using the partnership API, which that sounds like that's somewhat of a new concept. So you may have you may have some uh, questions back to your new relic team too, because that's again kind of unique based off your account structure. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess what questions do you guys have? Yeah.
Yeah, so I think one thing that helped us was that those who are earlier adopters, so, you, so uh, or even doing this, you can work, um, it may help to work with your new Relic account team to identify who are your power users, the highly active ones. They have some data you can query today to, to get out, like, again, who's accessing what or who's doing the most queries. So there's some interesting data that's also an NRDB just around activity. Um, so that can help you if, you're, if you have a large population and you don't have faces yet of, like, who, who's in that audience. Because then you can say, oh, wow, these people really use it a lot in these certain ways, then you, you can engage with them. Um, we also had it where we knew some people who were the early adopters, and they generally were always taking on newer features or trying to, and it would made it easy to say, hey, what, what, what are you working through? Because they usually were trying to adopt something new. Um, so that's kind of the, maybe the two ways I see it. The activity one, I think, is a pretty interesting piece of it. Because you'll find out we've had to do that too. You might have hit like limits or like things you put, you know, <laughs> Where we push New Relic to its limits on some parts of it, and that really helps too to find out well who's doing what, what, what kind of alert condition is that, or what Merkle query we need to investigate, or high cardinality data challenges. Uh, that that data set's helpful because usually you're trying to then find out oh of all these people when, where are we doing it or what entities have that data. Um, so yeah, there's some there's some good stuff. I I'll, I don't remember if there's good documentation on that, but I'll have to find I'll have to, I'll look it up for you. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 27,000? Yeah. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, so we kind of hit, we, we never hit, we, so we have, 25,000 people at our company, 1,000 users were at a given point in time, and that was like our 2000, uh, I think, tw uh, 19 type time window when we were seeing it. Uh, using your relic. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one uh, challenge. I don't know if people are familiar with the V1, V2 user. I see some head nodding there. That's another thing that's like a. So there's some stuff that's challenging in the V1 user model that New Relic has advanced. Uh, well, that's where we, that's probably a different topic because how you do your sub-account access of building that out. But you're right, when you get to really big, you're having, a, for our case, we use sub-accounts to help divide a lot of that up. Right. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the biggest probably thing to, I would say to take away is the V1 user model is, is challenging if you're growing a lot in that space. And so it, a lot of cases, if you have an identity provider you're going to integrate with that can help you say this is the right population for what accounts, that's what we're going towards because today it's a little bit of an a, a additional delegation of saying here's how we manage who has what access because it's separate. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah. We have, a, I would say, too, like a lot of, we had a lot of users as well. Think about this, we have a lot of sub-accounts that are like uh, for development environments. And so there's a lot of users that we give like full access in development environments. Um, but yeah, it, it, you have different, that's why we have a lot of sub-accounts today. Um, but we also try to figure out ways to minimize how many times when we introduce something new. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's another one. We've kind of helped document some things uh, externally about, I don't know if we've actually shared that externally. When we went through, we had to do a lot of stuff of uh, preventing. So like you talking about request parameters, configuration in the agent. Yeah, so there's a lot of things we have to disable in, in that for our on, on agent configuration. Um, that goes a little bit of like how we document things and how we just bake it into platform configuration. Uh, so if you're curious, like you can do things today to like essentially mask out identifiers that they're putting into like a request, like attributes that you'll see. Um, and that's agent side configuration. Um, that was really, what's that? No, yeah. Yeah, so that was one thing that I think we've actually shared a talk several feature stacks back, um, which was a little bit around when we first were talking about what things we were trying to document around it. If you're familiar, you can use different, like you can use high security mode. That's pretty restrictive. Um, but you can also have different uh, configuration options around that too. Yeah. Any other questions? 
All right. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the future stack.